Okay, Code of Professional Conduct or CPC. So when I say CPC, um, code, this one. People get confused because sometimes they think King Code or Code of Professional Conduct. When we refer to King, we say King. When we refer to the Code of Professional Conduct, we say Code or CPC. Okay, that's the sort of common, the common uh, auditing language. Okay, so there's um. We spoke a little bit about the background when we spoke about the Auditing Profession Act, but just with regards to the code here, we've got three codes, okay? There's a Psychic Code, there's an Urba Code, and there's an IFAC Code, okay? Now, if you look at the three together, in all material respects, they're very similar, okay? You only need to learn the Psychic Code currently, um, but the Urba Code is the same except for everywhere it says Chartered Accountant, it says Registered Auditor. So, it's, like I said, pretty much the same thing. Even the code itself is broken up into... It's broken up into three parts, part A, part B, and part C. Part A is applicable to everyone. Part B is applicable to registered auditors, and part C is applicable to chartered accountants. But remember, if you're a registered auditor, you're also a chartered accountant. So you learn one code, you've learned three. Sweet, hey? Three pieces of cake with one spoon. That's the best type of cake. Okay, so there's three, you learn the one. That's the part A, B, and C like that I spoke about. The main focus will be on part B. You're an auditor and things come up, okay? However, you could have someone at the client that is a CA. You'll know that they're a CA because you'll see their name with the designation just behind it, that they also need to apply the code. So yes, most of the time we're going to talk about the audit people that have you know, issues with regards to the code. But there will also be people that are in business, someone like the financial director, your client. If they're a CA, they also need to comply. Okay. So firstly, ah, before I go through the structure, I'd like to... Ugh, what's going on here? There we go. I'd like to go through the technique because... I want you guys to know why we're going through a particular section to know how it's going to look when you write it, essentially. Because again, it doesn't help just learning all the theory and not knowing where it fits in, in the grander scheme of things, okay? It's important for us to know, why would I need to know this? When I'm highlighting, when I'm flagging or whatever, what key words am I highlighting? What key things am I looking for? What groups of things am I flagging? So it's important to know that. So I'm going to go through the technique here first because the code is long, okay? So we need to be very particular about how we structure our flagging and highlighting so that it fits in with what we actually need it for. Are you with me? You don't just randomly flag and highlight. You highlight and flag as required for what you need to be writing. <clears throat> so in the code, we've got various, I like to call them situations, okay? And a situation is something that could cause a threat to a fundamental principle. I'll give you some examples. We're going to go through them just now, like getting a gift from a client or having a, a, a spouse at your client or earning shares in the client or getting a loan from your client. Okay, These are situations that could cause threats to our fundamental principles. Now, the way you need to structure your, your discussion when you're answering a code of professional or ethical question is you structure it by situation. So you might have, for example, in the information, you might have three situations, okay, whatever they may be, and that's your heading. So it could be loan, it could be shares, it, could, it doesn't matter. You break it up per situation. For each situation, so each situation is your heading, okay? For each situation, there are five things that you need to write, oops, for each situation to get your maximum marks, okay? <clears throat> Number one, you need to write which threat. What does it mean when someone writes like that, when they write an S in brackets? What does that mean? Do you guys know? Could be one or more than one, yes? little hint, more, more often not, it's more than one. And that's why I do that, because people think one for one. No, no, hardly ever is it one and one. It'll happen sometimes, but more often than not, it's zzz. 
And the cool thing about this is it's like a five. So there's five threads. So the S helps you remember that there's actually five. And we'll talk about them, and we'll talk about how do you know which one's which. And then we need to say, okay, well, which principle? Oops. Again, five, like a snake goes, okay? Again, five principles, five threads, five principles. High five yourself, you've got the first bit of marks, okay? Now that's where people think, okay, well, I'm done. And that's where most people fall short because that's just the first part of the marks. As you can see, there is more to come. The third one is explain. Okay. Now this, guys, I put a star next to it because that, those first two, let's call it, we put them in a sentence. So there is a self-interest threat to objectivity. Cool. Let's, for argument's sake, say I say that. Do you know how many self-interest threats there are to objectivity? Yo. Explain. Why, why would that cause a self-interest threat to my objectivity? Well, because I've got shares in the client, I might not be you know, as objective when looking at the negative things, for example, because I want my share price to increase. I'm not going to be as objective. And the reason that I put a star next to it is because that one is worth a lot of marks. It's normally, it could be one and it could be five. Okay, depending on how much you need to explain. You need to explain the hell out of everything. Well, I own shares and I'm the partner, and it's not only one share that I have out of a million, it's 20% of all the shares, which is quite a significant. Can you see that? It's a explaining why. Don't just tell me it's a threat. Why? Why? Okay, don't forget to explain. Don't just tell me there's a threat. Explain. You're not explaining to me because I don't know. You're explaining to me because I need to know that you know. Number four, significance. Now, a theme in the code is you identify the threat, you need to then assess the level of significance of it, and if it's significant, apply appropriate safeguards, which is five, okay? More often than not, okay, let's, okay. Every time you write this sentence, it will be significant in your tests. In real life, it's not always. In your test, it's always significant. So what do you write there? The threat is significant because. Okay? With me? Why? Because otherwise you're not going to continue writing and there's no point of you writing it in the first place. <laughs> With me? In your tests, it is always significant. Okay? Remember, you've always got to understand that there's a difference between theory and what happens in the real world. In theory, everything's significant. Okay? You with me? Because you're following the strict rules to the T. You with me? Because in practice, it's like, eh. Theory is black and white. The practice is gray. Okay. So, it is significant because. Now, because what? It could be because of the amount in question. So, if they gave you a loan, the amount of shares... <clears throat> but now you need to be careful because let's say I own one share in Apple, okay? Now, let's say that share is worth, just throwing it out there, 5,000 Rand, okay? Now, to Apple, that is like, pff, what is? That's like nothing, right? But maybe to me, as an individual, maybe that's my life savings. So just because it's one share... And that it's not significant for Apple is not the question. The question is, is it significant to affect me? Is that my life savings in that one share? Or is it just like, or maybe I'm a billionaire and 5,000 Rand is like what ifs? Hmm? So it's not the matter of significance in terms of percentage of shares or significance to the company. It's significant to the individual concerned. If you give me, I don't know, a holiday. You say, yeah, I've got time share somewhere here. I take it. Thanks for everything. You know, you're my client, right? I might be, again, a billionaire on that, but you might be like, well, whatevs. But normally, that's going to be a big deal. That's why I said in practice, it's slightly different. In theory, every little thing you get is going to be significant. Everything. The only times I've ever seen something that's not too significant in a theory question is a meal, like one meal, like obviously not an extravagant like meal, like a lunch or something, or a pen. 
That's the only time I've ever seen something in a theory question to not be significant. What does that tell you? It's always significant. Okay. You with me? It's significant because the amount involved is significant to the person involved. Someone that doesn't have holidays, that might be the best thing ever. And then they're going to want to keep them happy so that they can get the holiday every year or whatever. Okay. It could also be significant because of the the role the person plays. So the first year trainee versus the audit partner or audit manager. Obviously, the more senior you get, the more significant it gets. And it's also got to do with the relationship between who at the client. So if it's the relationship with like, I don't know, the receptionist versus the financial director, again, if it's with the FD, it's a lot more significant than if it's with the receptionist. That's your wife, for example. Okay. Please guys, whatever the situation is, argue that it is significant. Find a reason for it to be significant. Why? Because you're writing. It is significant because you make it significant. Okay. Cool. And then the last one is safeguards. Again, I'm going to put a star next to that one. Why? Because there's not one thing that we ever write there. Hey. There's more than one mark available there. Can you see the two big ones, number three and number five? Which ones do you think people forget all the time? Uh-huh, you guessed it right, the big ones. Please don't forget the big ones. Those are the ones you get the most marks for. So if this um, situation, so situation one, if it was allocated eight or 10 marks, more than half of them are in, sitting in three and five. Are you with me? So if you forget some, don't forget three and five. People t tend to forget those. I don't know why. Maybe they don't like odd numbers. I don't know. Please, guys, those are the most marks in those two parts of the technique. Okay. Now that we know what we're looking for and how to write, now we're going to go through the stuff and you're going to know where it fits in in the grander scheme of things. Before I continue, though, with regards to flagging, I would suggest you can flag the way you think is right. Going to part B of the code. Okay. Part B is where all the situations are. You flag the situations. So on your flag, you'll say loans, fees, shares in client, all the situations that we're going to go through shortly. That's your flag. Why? Because those are your headings. When you open that page, when you see, okay, well, there's a situation, I identified that there were shares, you open the flag, and what are the things you're going to highlight in that thing? Now, this thing might be three pages long. Please don't highlight three pages. What are you going to highlight? You're going to highlight keywords. Like what? Principles, threats, safeguards. That's it. Why? Because that's what you need to be writing. So when you open the page, so you've got your heading, you write the heading. Oh, look, there's shares in the client. There, where's my shares in the client? Oh, look, there it is. And then I've got the, oh, there's the principles, there's the threats. Can you see that? So that is the way I would suggest you flag part B. Flags are your situations, and then you highlight. Maybe you can even like highlight your principles in pink, and then your threats in blue, and then your safeguards in green, for example, or whatever. And then you kind of have your own little method of doing because you can't write in your book, obviously. So maybe you can have your own little system of, you know, highlighting in that way. But please only highlight keywords. Comfortable with that? Why? Because that's how you're going to be writing. Hey, so structure your highlighting and flagging as you would write it. I find that that would be of most help. Okay. So let's quickly go through them. The principles. Okay. Five principles. I've put them in little brackets here. The I, the O, the C, PC, and PB. Because later on I'm going to just write PC and then you'll know what it is. Okay. In the slides. Okay. Integrity. Um, whenever I think of integrity, I think of honesty. Are you being honest or are you lying about something? Manipulating something. Okay. Next one. Objectivity. Okay. Um, I like to say if someone wants to sweep something under the carpet. Now, objectivity is the, the let's call it the basket that catches all. So when we go through the, our analysis, I'll come back to it just now, which one comes up most often? Objectivity. Okay? Please note, objectivity is the principle. Independence, 
a synonym for objectivity, but technically the principle is called objectivity, okay? So if you want to be technically correct, you're going to write objectivity and not independence, okay? But it's the same thing. <laughs> but if you want to be technically correct, objectivity is the word. Confidentiality, we spoke a little bit about that earlier, didn't we? You're not allowed to share any kind of information, okay, obviously, unless you have to report to Uber, unless you have to report to a regulator now that we said with the no claw, or unless the client gives you permission to do so. It's like your friend tells you a secret. She says, don't tell anyone. You don't tell anyone unless she says, okay, you can tell your husband or your friend, you know, your mom or whatever. You don't say it until you get permission to do so. Okay. Or if the law requires. So in that situation, say your friend tells you she's pregnant. You don't tell anyone. But then she's in an accident, then you've got to tell the doctors, look, she's pregnant. Can you, you know what I'm saying? You, at some point, you've got to break the confidentiality, right? Okay. Cool. Professional competence. Now, people often get confused between professional competence and professional behavior. Okay, professional competence. Do I have the knowledge and skill to do the job I'm busy doing? When we're talking about competence, we're talking about the auditing standards. Am I complying with the auditing standards? Okay? When I'm talking, like the audit, the stuff that you are studying currently. Not only auditing, so it's the auditing, the efforts, I'm talking auditing, you know, my subject, but the stuff you're studying, that has got to do with competence. The stuff you're studying, think about the stuff that you need to get an education, to get your degree. That has got to do with your competence. The auditing standards, the IFRS, okay? Can I, am I complying with that? When you're talking about professional behavior, I'm talking about other laws. So not speeding, not drinking and driving, not killing people, whatever, not doing drugs. It's got nothing to do with you know, my knowledge of auditing, but I'm still breaking the law. Can you see? It's not, it's two sort of separate areas. Again, we draw the line, you know, remember when we, we did that breakdown between with laws and regulations, laws that directly affect and then other ones. So the laws that directly affect those ones that we study during our course of our education, those are competence. The indirect ones that are not necessarily I, mean, I might do drugs, but I might be an excellent, you know, auditor. It's still wrong. My competence is not in question, but it's not, you know, I'm not complying with the law. Can you see that? It's different elements of laws. So competence has got to do with the ones you study, the direct ones, as we say. Behavior has got to do with other laws that you need to comply with. Okay. So that is the distinction between the two. But there's a bit more to professional behavior, okay? So professional behavior, they're saying, yeah, I'll comply with law. So that's step, the first part of it. Then, with regards to marketing, any sort of advertising or publicity, also professional behavior. They've, they didn't sort of know where to put it, so they've put it in there with professional behavior, okay? Anything that's got to do with advertising. Okay, remember, you're not going to see auditors or hear auditors on the radio going like, we're the best auditors in the town, you know, best prices, come here, we will make sure you leave with a smile on your face, you know, with a happy opinion, I don't know. You don't hear that. Why? Because advertising has to be objective, it has to be factual, and it has to be not um, making someone else that's also in order to look bad. It's kind of like driving on the road, like you kind of want to let a Ferrari in, but you don't want to let a, like a skadonk in. It's, it's every car gets the right, you know, every car one for one. Whether you're driving a Ferrari or a skadonk or a truck, you one for one. doesn't matter how big or small or expensive or cheap your car is, it's one for one. So in the same way, in order to, uh, you know, one RA must treat another RA with equal respect. So I can't say I'm better than this RA because you're both RAs. You're on the same level. How can you be better? That means you're discrediting another RA. So when it comes to advertising, you're never going to see we're better than them or cheaper than them or smarter than them because you're making the other ones look bad and you're not allowed to do that. We're all fellow CAs and RAs here. We all the same level of respect. Like every car on the road has the same level of turns as so do we, as so do we in our profession. Because I, I make them look bad, can you see that I'm actually making myself look bad as well? Because if I make another RA look bad, all RAs look bad. Okay. With me. Okay, so any advertising? They do like to ask about advertising. They'll make like a stupid obvious one. Like they'll say this, there was clowns doing dances and mocking the other auditorium or something stupid. You're like really not allowed. 
okay? So anything that's got to do with advertising, professional behavior. Signing, okay, you're not allowed to sign on behalf of someone else. However, let's be honest, life happens, you know, you have to unexpectedly go away. You are allowed to delegate your signing, but you can only delegate to someone in your firm. So if we're, you know, if the, these two rows here, we're all one auditing firm, if I, for whatever reason, had to go to Hong Kong for some emergency, I can delegate someone else in my firm to sign, okay, but only in my firm. If I happen to be a sole proprietor, then I have to speak to Uber and they will allocate someone to sign for me in obviously extreme circumstances. Because one of the rules of improper conduct says you can't just leave your responsibilities. But again, like I said, life happens. People, there's going to be emergencies and things. You can't, not intentionally, you're just running away from your responsibilities. I have to go for an emergency, whatever the case may be. They will then delegate someone to sign on my behalf. Because remember what we said, you've got to find the person's name. So if you allocate someone, that person's name is going to be on your report. If you're getting someone to sign for you, you're ultimately delegating that responsibility to someone else. Okay. Cool. Happy with that? Look like you have a question. No? Okay. Don't be shy. And then other duties. Are you allowed to be a member of many firms? Sure, as long as there's no conflict. So I'm allowed to be an audit, part of an audit firm here and have a baking shop. Sure, it's got nothing to do with each other, right? But I can't have an auditing firm and then another auditing firm because then they would be competing with each other unless they've got completely separate clients, completely different geographic regions. So they're saying it's not precluded, but you've really got to consider it properly. Like, is there going to be any possible conflict at all? Okay. You're not allowed to, um, what's the word? Induce or steal employees from other firms. So, yes, solicit, that's the word. You, the responsibility to colleagues, I said, if you find that one of your fellow CAs or RAs is not complying with the law, you don't just go run and tell, you say, let me help you fix it, blah, blah, blah. If they then don't, you then go and talk to the person. Like, think about, for those of you that have kids, if there's something wrong with your kid, the teacher's not immediately going to run to run to mom and dad. They're going to first talk to their kid and say, fix this. And if it doesn't get fixed that way, then they'll go to the next step. You with me? So you don't just run to the run to you know tell 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 all the time. You think, okay, well let me try and sort this out right now before it becomes an issue. And if he doesn't listen, then you say, okay, well I'm going to have to report you. For example, you with me? Okay. And cold calling, man. We all hate those, hey. Do you know what cold calling is? You know those people that phone you and they're like, do you want? And you're like, no, no, bye. You know those people? They're not saying you can't do it, but they're saying you need to be careful when you do it. So in, if you read between the lines, they're kind of indirectly saying don't do it because it's not like a, okay. But they're not saying it's against any codes to do it, but it's just not like a, I mean, who likes that seriously? So principles. <clears throat> now, I like to go through it in a sort of, uh, What's it called? Process of elimination. Has it got to do with my knowledge in terms of efforts, in terms of auditing? No. Has it got to do with me breaking any laws? No. Has it got to do with me sharing any client confidential information? Maybe, maybe not. No. Has it got to do with any information that is false or misleading? No. I go through those. Though why? Why do I go through those first? Because those are very particular. They're very specific situations that you'll find these in. It's not like these are always there for everyone, okay? You go through these. If you find the right one, then you stick with it. If it doesn't fit any of them, the answer is objectivity. But what you'll find is, I'm going to put an O plus. Why? Because it's normally one of them plus objectivity. Most of the time, like 99% of the time, objectivity will be written in your, for each situation, okay? So you go through the process. If, you, if it's not any one of those, objectivity. If it is one of them, continue considering if there's any more plus objectivity. With me? That's the sort of, I put objectivity at the end because it's kind of like plus that one anyway. You with me? And we'll do this, something similar with our threats as well. Okay, so let's go to our threats. Again, five threats. Okay, yeah, boy.
professional behavior. So both of them, so, so, so uh, do, 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 do. professional behavior is the complying with laws, marketing, and signing. That's all professional behavior. So they've, they were kind of weird ones. They didn't really fit anywhere else, so they, they've decided that it's part of professional behavior. So those two are both professional behavior. Okay? Cool? Yay. Threats. Five threats. Firstly, self-interest. Either personal interest or a financial interest. Okay? Um, You'll find that this is the most common threat. Self-review. Don't you wish you could mark your own tests? I'm, I know I meant that. I'm sure I meant that. But obviously, that's not allowed. And that very much ties in with the Companies Act, which says you can't do apps and then audit them. Because that would be like marking your own homework, wouldn't it? Okay? That is quite a particular one. Now, what I'd like to do is... Okay. Who's resp okay, so we audit apps, right? We pre prepare an opinion on the apps. Who actually prepares the apps? Management. They might hire someone else to do it, whatever, but it's their responsibility. So if they ask us to do that, can you see that we're asking us to do management's job? Interesting threat. Jump to advocacy. A lot of people don't understand this threat, but it's actually quite, when, when, once I've explained it, I don't think you'll ever struggle with it again, okay? Um, for those of you that know me, you'll know this cute little story I give. Okay, everyone knows how tennis works, you know, people hit the ball over the net, yeah. Let's picture on one side of the court is management working for the company their business trying to make money and on the other side of the court is the auditor who does the auditor work for the public we are in public practice the opinion that we provide is for public use why because it's not addressed to a specific recipient it's addressed to many we work for the public if you call it like that okay so on one side we have management for company and on the other side we have auditor for public I cannot work for the public on this side of the tennis court and hit back to myself from the other side of the tennis court, can I? Advocacy means I'm working for the client, the company, and the public at the same time. can't do that. So anything that is management's responsibility, if the auditor needs to do it, it's an advocacy threat. And that could be anything. That could be being the company secretary, being a director, being the financial director, being a financial controller, being someone that is in HR, being someone that is in operations. Anything that's got to do with working for management is an advocacy threat because there's a problem. Who am I reporting to? If I'm reporting to management, that's a problem. If I'm reporting to the public through my opinion, then I'm working for, can you see? I can't work for both. I can't play on both sides of the tennis court. Are you with me? Now, I talk about this one with self-review. Now, let's think. If I am preparing the apps, whose job is that? Well, that's management's job. Can you see that that is also an advocacy threat? Okay, what am I saying? Whenever you have a self-review threat, you will also always have an advocacy threat. Okay? Makes sense? Because that's management's job to prepare the apps, blah, blah, blah. Always. Be careful. Whenever you have an advocacy threat, you don't necessarily have a self-review threat, though. Huh? Why? Because if they hire me to do some <laughs> random thing, like be an HR and hire some person, it's got nothing to do with the apps. So it's not going to be a self-review threat, but I'm still working for management. Are you with me? Okay, let's say that again. Whenever I have a self-review threat, it is always with an advocacy threat. Why? Because anything that's got to do with preparing the apps and anything that goes with it is also working for management. So it's always going to be advocacy as well. So self-review always plus advocacy. However, if it's advocacy, it's not necessarily always self-review because what I do for management might not necessarily be also for the apps. 
You with me there? Okay. A little bit tricky. Do you understand those two? So those two, we talk about them together because they really overlap each other. You all happy with advocacy? Hope so. I like to think that after I've explained it, people are like, oh, I've, like after all this time, I'm like, that's what it means. Well, that's what I hope to achieve. Okay, so that's those three. Familiarity, familia, I like to say. Are we getting too close, part of the familia? Remember, family is not just blood. Okay? Family is a lot more than that. So, I mean, we almost like a family after this year. We spend so much time together. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, it's all about the time spent together. The, the longer you spend, the, long, the, the more time you spend with someone, the more, you know, familiar you'll get. Okay. And then finally, intimidation. Could be tricky. Intimidation, there's two elements to it. I can intimidate you directly and be like, you give me a clean opinion or you're fired. Or if you don't give me a clean opinion, I'll boom, boom you in the head. You know, this is quite an obvious direct threat. Or the less obvious ones, which are a lot more apparent, are the ones that are indirect, where I say, well, he has a Ferrari. And then I come to the next, I'm like, enjoy your Ferrari. Is my opinion going well? Hey, it is. Hey, I'm sure it is. You're still enjoying that Ferrari. Huh? So it's not saying it, but it's there. It's kind of like, well, I want that keen opinion, else you can say goodbye to your Ferrari. Those are the dangerous type of threats. Those are the ones that are most common in your questions. The most common one that comes through is a gift. Getting a gift is an intimidation threat. Okay. The indirect kind, obviously. Okay, so coming back here, threats. Now, self review and advocacy, I kind of put together, okay? Why? Because we spoke about how most of the time they will be together. Sometimes advocacy will be by itself. Remember, if you're doing something not related to the apps, but it's quite an obvious threat. You're either doing it or you're not. It's not like uh, it could be. It either is or it isn't. And the same thing goes with the familiarity threat and the intimidation threat. We've either known each other for long or we haven't. You know, it's not like a, there's no in between. Or I'm either giving you a gift or threatening you or I'm not. It's, it's a, it is or it isn't. So again, like we did with the principles, we go through the first four. And if we find that it's not one of them, we then everything else will be self-interest. And what you'll find at the end of the day is that most of your answers will have those words in them. Because the other ones are for very particular ones and everything else is those two. Are you with me? So most of the time you will have the word self-interest and the word objectivity in your solution. And in the same way, if it's any of the ones on the top, it can also be self-interest. Why? Because if you are doing something, let's take a self-review for example. If you are I don't know, preparing some calculations or journals for the client, self-review threat, obviously, with advocacy. And how would that be a self-interested as well? Well, if someone finds out that I'm not complying with the Companies Act and my own auditing laws and the code, that's going to affect me and the, you know, remember what I said, uh, uh, it could be a personal or a financial interest. Personally, it's going to affect me because I might lose my job, I might lose my accreditation, I might bring the profession into disrepute. Can you see that? So I can almost always argue self-interest. Almost always. So what I'm saying is don't be shy to go self-interest plus and then the objectivity plus. Do you, know, do you know what I mean by that? Are you all comfortable with my little funny things? Any questions? Yes. No. If it's, it, it depends, okay, it depends, again, practice. In your tests, absolutely not. In real life, if it's a public interest entity, so an entity that is listed or, no, not allowed at all. So, <clears throat> I know my husband works for one of the big audit, audit firms and they had, uh, you know, you have different departments, so you have, they have audits for this type of client, like, I don't know, like 
a retail clients and then they have auditing for mining clients and then they have banking clients. So they had uh, one of those departments was a small businesses uh, department where they do sort of smaller type of entities that were sort of miscellaneous that didn't fit into one of the other categories. And if you can imagine that there a lot of those smaller types of audits, there was another department in a different building that did you know, the accounting work for them. When the new companies that came out, they had to stop that. So they either had to stop the audit or they had to stop the accounting work. Why? Because it was all under the same name. So although it's a different company, different building, it was still the same company, right? It's the same name, not allowed. I think it depends on the level of separation between the departments and stuff and how you can prove the independence thereof. But the, I know the ones for the big companies and the big clients, absolutely not. Not because of anything else, but not, it's, the code says sometimes public interest, companies act says no. So you can't just consider the code. So the code, like I said, is a public interest, different buildings, departments, is not such a big client, not too many stakeholders, but the companies then act says no. So you've got to consider both. And remember, the companies act as law, the code is just ethics. So law kind of, you've got to follow the law. So no, unfortunately not. So that happened a couple of years ago. Okay, comfortable with, yes. Mm -hmm. Integrity. How? How is there indirectly? Like the, the ones that are quite, that's why. I hear what you're saying, and eventually, I suppose you could argue, 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 and get there. But normally, what happens, and the way we structure it, is you go through those four. If it's not those four, even if it is one or two or three of them, it's always plus going to be self-interest because that's the almost the common one. I'm sure there are ways to argue each and every one of them every single time at some point. But you've also got to draw the line and be like, okay, well, this is the standard. This is what they expect from me. This is what the way I need to write. Do you know what I mean? I see it could be, but you must also remember in the code, there's asked, they, they do allocate specific threats to um, specific situations it, when you, you know, flag and highlight and whatnot. When you find it there, you'll often see self-interest popping up all over the place. And that's why I say that's the plus one. If you feel that you can argue it, then by all means, argue it. Well, that's why you've got your book and you've got the normal way it's done. Yeah. And remember, what we've just said, that's just points one and two. We are most of your marks, people. Not there. So at the end of the day, don't spend too much time worrying about if it is or it isn't. Rather, just write it, whatever, and focus on number three and five. Because that's where you need to focus. You with me? So I'm giving you like a, a how can I say it? Like a structure method to do this. Test those four, if not, plus self-interest. Or if it is one of those, plus self-interest. I'm giving you a method that works most of the time. So you can follow a consistent approach in answering your questions to get maximum marks. You must remember something else, guys. I maybe should have said this in the beginning, but these little methods and techniques and stuff that I give, it's not going to look the same as the solution that they have, right? But the problem with them is, is that they have an inconsistent way of answering the same type of question, okay? So they'll answer a code of professional conduct question this way this time, and then the next year they'll answer in a different, like a different order, for example, or a different structure. Oh, they have different lectures, different people, sure, it's gonna happen, right? So how do I come up with this stupid little, I didn't just suck it out of my bum. I, I look through years and years, I mean, I've got stuff from, actually, from 2009, that I go through, including ITC papers from 2003. I go through all of those and I find all the CPC questions, for example. And I say, okay, well, what do I need to make sure is included in this solution? So it's not going to be in the same order. It's not going to look the same. What is important, though, is that you have a consistent method of answering the question and that everything that I'm telling you to write is in the solution. Not in the same order, but it's there. 
So if you write what I tell you to write every time, you'll get all the marks. Like I said, it's not going to look the same, maybe in a different order, but you can't follow a haphazard order. You need to follow a consistent method. That is how you're going to get your marks. Every time you get a CPC question, you know what to do. Steps one to five. Every time you get a audit in profession, that question, I know, definition five parts apply. You have to have a consistent method to answer questions. How else are you going to know which order they decided to do it in that day? If you can guess that, then wow, I'm impressed. Then you got like a crystal ball or something. So I make these methods, not I don't make them up, I base it on what they have in there and try and find a method that works for any type of question, whichever way the wind was blowing them that way, that day, I have a method that helps you get all the marks you need. That's what my methods are. So it's not going to look exactly the same as the solution. Sometimes it will, <laughs> sometimes it won't. But the point is, the stuff you have written is going to be the stuff in the solution and you will get the marks. You understand? Okay. So I might call it something else. I might call it an up or a down or a left or a PB or whatever. The point is, it's my little, you know, quirky things. Okay. It's not what they call it. I'm just helping you. So think about it. When you get to the code, what do you need to remember? You just need to remember steps one to five. That's all you need to remember in terms of studying and memorizing. Everything else, it comes through practice. All you need to know is steps one to five. CCPC, okay, I know, steps one to five. And then you go, practice. That's the way I go through things. I give you a method, a template to fill in for every type of question. Yes? Happy? Okie dokie. Okay, so remember, we fill these in, often it's more than one, but remember that's not actually where most of the marks are. Okay, so don't worry too much about the stuff that you're not going to get the most marks out of. We're focusing mainly on three and five. Okay, now we get to situations, and this is part B of the code. So that stuff, you know, the principles, the threats, they're all in part A, but you know the definite, you don't have to go and flag and highlight part A. I mean, you know what the principles are, there's five, it's not like there's 50, okay? All you need to do is go to the situations, flag them, and highlight the keywords that you need. That's all. You know what a, the difference between a threat and a principle is now. It's not rocket science. And if you forget, you flip to part A and you're like, oh, yeah, whoops, that one, I forgot that one. It's really not like you have to study it. Now, the situations, there's this gray slide. It says, this is the structure. So the big point, the, the, the main bullet point, that big one there, is gives you the thread and the principle, and then it gives you the explanation and the safeguards under as the sub bullet points. Okay. And then the heading of the slide is the situation. And this is literally going through the code. Okay. So these are, so what's on here, for example, the first one is professional appointment. That's what you're going to flag. And then the keywords you're going to highlight. Make sense? Okay. And I go through it literally through the code as, as it goes. Professional appointments, this has got very much to do with pre-engagement, which we're going to be looking at next test now. Okay. Can we accept any client? Now think about it. <laughs> yeah. You all know that sort of personal inside joke thing that I'm thinking. I don't want to say anything. Um, can we accept any client? In practice, things are very gray, guys. Very gray. In theory, if the client is maybe slightly, possibly a little bit teeny weeny bit dodgy the answer in theory is no okay why because theory is black and white okay yes or no in practice this is not a, this is not uh, what happens in real life you need to understand that there's a separation kind of okay in theory in your tests and exams no even if it's slightly maybe no okay so what are your so what what principles do you think could be affected? If I hire, if I if I uh, accept a client that is possibly dodgy, what could it surely it could affect many things? Hey, integrity, yeah, and professional behaviour. I'm going to bring the profession into disrepute, won't I? Because one auditor does a bad job, and what, the, what does the public think about all the other auditors? Yes, order those auditors. They think they all, all that, and actually they suck. And, it happens. You do so you, one person does it, and now the whole profession is in disrepute. Did you guys hear what happened after last year about how we used to be? Uh huh. We used to be at the top of the list, and we're no longer at the top of the list because, yeah, you know, 
can you see how it's actually a perfect example of how our you know how certain individuals created a disrepute for the profession Hectic, okay so what are our safeguards? Making sure we have quality control, making sure we do appropriate background checks on the client, making sure that we do as much as possible to make sure that we're not dealing with budgie people. Okay. Um, if there's uh, taking over a client from someone else, we're going to get to that when we get to the Companies Act and King, kind of. But um, sure. Uh, If you take over from someone else, surely it needs to be like a smooth handover. You can't just be like, well, haha, they got fired, you know, na 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 na, you know, type thing. It has to be like, well, did you, were you properly appointed or did you get noticed, you know? Because if they just fired you as the auditor, what's to say they won't do the same to me? So surely you want a good relationship with the previous one. And that's going to become more common now with the whole rotation of auditors, isn't it? Okay. So everybody done? Sweet. So make sure you contact the previous auditor. So when we get to pre-engagement, you'll see one of the requirements. You have to contact the previous auditor. No choice. Okay, why? To make sure that they weren't fired for really bad reasons and to know that they actually are fired. Sometimes they'll hire you and they don't, the other auditors don't even know that they've been fired. And you're like, well, that's not good. How do I know they won't do that to me? Do you want to deal with someone like that? Probably not. Remember, if it's slightly, maybe a little bit, possibly dodgy, no. Conflicts of interest. Auditing competitors, surely there's going to be, you're auditing, I don't know, Vodacom and MTN. Surely there's going to be, you're going to learn about some secrets and whatnot. What do you think is the most logical thing to do in that situation? Communicate. Say, Mr. Mr. MTN, I see that you've approached me to be your auditor. Are you comfortable with the fact that there's another team that is auditing? They might be like, no, sorry. Or they might be like, sure, as long as you've got separate teams, they don't talk to each other, the information, you know, of the minutes of meetings that we keep, and I mean, imagine the stuff we're looking at is kept confidential, they sign confidentiality agreements, maybe they're fine with it, maybe they're not. Okay, so it's about communication, and then putting in appropriate barriers as necessary. Acting as an auditor and to negotiate the sale of a client's shares. Now, that's the example that they give, which is a very weird example, because, like, let's be honest, how often would that happen? That's the advocacy threat that they give an example of. But now we know, actually, what advocacy is. Hey, it's doing anything for management, whether it's selling shares, whether it's an HR position, whether it's operations, whatever it may be, advocacy. That's the example that they give for advocacy, but you now know what's advocacy. Tennis, okay. Yeah. Second, opinions. <clears throat> now, this is not relevant for an audit. Why? Because for an audit, you can't get a second opinion. Huh. So, I don't know why it's in the audit section. Anyway, a second opinion is often for an accounting opinion. So, here's, you know, my contract. Can you please tell me, is this fair value through profit and loss or fair value through OCR? Or cost? And you'd be like, oh, I think it's fair value through profit and loss. And then I'm like, oh, I don't really like that answer. What do you think? And then you're like, well, fair value through OCI. Yeah. I like that answer better. Or maybe I don't like that one either. And then, So often you're thinking, why would the client be like opinion shopping, right? Now, you've got to think to yourself, if you two come up with a different answer, surely one, one of you is wrong because there's only one right answer, hey? So either way, one of you is making the other one look bad. So what is the most appropriate thing to do? I come to you and I say, I got this opinion from Mrs. Pink over there. Mrs. Blue, can you please tell me what you think? What, what should Mrs. Blue do? Mrs. Blue should talk to Ms. Pink and say, well, what made you come to this answer? Is there something that you know that maybe I don't? Or is there something that I know that maybe you don't? Let's help each other. Let's come to a conclusion together. In my previous company that I worked for before I came to lecture here, I was in the technical accounting department, and we provided opinions to people on accounting, right? Like technical accounting opinions. And our firm policy was we weren't allowed to provide second opinions because the risk was too great. That was a firm policy. It wasn't necessarily a code thing. It was our firm's policy because it's just too risky. So account accounting opinions, fine. Audit opinions, not ever. So you'll hardly ever see this one come up. Which ones will you come up, see come up? This one, for instance. If the fee is too high, it's pretty much like getting a gift, isn't it? 
well, I'm going to keep them happy so I can keep getting this massive fee. And I'm picturing myself swimming in a pool of money, throwing it up in the air and dancing on the bed. And you know that whole picture that can you see it? It's like, then I want to keep them happy so I can keep swimming in the pool of money, right? Whereas if the fee is too low, what principle is affected if the fee is too high? It's obviously objectivity, right? And it's intimidation, possibly. If the fee is too low, it's a different principle affected. So be careful. That's why they like to ask it because it's split into too high and too low. If the fee is too low, it affects, believe it or not, my competence. Why? Because the auditing standards require me to plan and do risk assessment and materiality and responses and, 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 and I need time to do that. If I don't get a big enough fee, what is our fee? Our fee is hours times rate, isn't it? If I don't have rate, I mean fee, my hours has to decrease, doesn't it? And then I don't have time to follow all the standards like I should be. In which case my competence is threatened. So be careful of that one. They like to ask it because it's a different principle affected objectivity versus competence if it's high or low. Then there's also contingent fees. Um, we're not allowed contingent fees for us. You can't have like an audit fee based on the percentage of profit. No, audit is hours times rate. Full stop the end. There's no other option. Okay, hours times rate. For other things, you can, like, what if I lecture to you guys, but I also sell houses on the side? Surely I can get a contingent fee. That's normal, right? That's a normal practice for every percentage of the house you sell. So if it's a common thing that you get a contingent fee for, sure. Not ever for an audit. So again, some of these things are not necessarily specific to audits because they're just not relevant for them. But like I said, there's nothing wrong with me getting a contingent fee for selling a house. Is there? That's normal. Obviously not like an exorbitant amount, as long as it's a normal range or whatever their fees are between, I don't know, 5 and 10%, whatever. Whatever their fees are, if it's within the range, then it's fine. But not ever for an audit. Can you see, some of these things aren't even relevant for audits. Gifts. Intimidation. Now look how many threats there are here. You're going to give, give a gift to a complete stranger? No. It's normally someone you get to know a little bit better. Oh, I know she likes Katy Perry. Let me give her tickets to the concert, you know? I don't know. Self-interest. Why? Self-interest is always there, guys. You'll see it pop up all over the place. So the main ones are intimidation. Remember I told you that? The indirect threat. Best answer. No, thank you. If it's too late and it's the day after the concert, what do I do then? Well, then I've got to pay them back how much it was worth. Unfortunately, because sometimes they'll tell you, oh, but he already went away. What now? Well, you've got to pay it back. Best, no thank you. If it's too late, pay it back. Then. Unless it's like pen. You understand? Like, okay. Cool. So that one's quite common as well. Oh, and this one they love. And this one they love for the biggest reason is because the safeguards for this one, there's like six. So if, if we think about all the other situations that are like five-ish, maybe seven marks, this one's at least 10. They love asking this one because it's more discussion required. Again, it's in sections three and five in my little technique. You with me? But this one is the biggest one. And they, I, I, I swear this one's the most common one that I've seen. Remember, I'm, I'm telling you some stats. I'm not telling you what will or will not be in the test. So please don't... I'm not a fortune teller. I don't know what's going to come on the 13th of March. I'm just giving you stats. You can interpret them as you wish. Just making that clear up front. Custody of client assets. Which assets are you likely to hold money? Yeah. The most people often say, like, how can a client not have a bank account? Well, often if they're not a resident in the Republic, you can't have a bank account. So you might need to open a bank account in their behalf, for example. Okay. It's, it's, it could happen. It's very often happens. Okay. Can you keep money for your client? Sure. Are you a financial service provider that's allowed to earn interest? In? No. No, you're not. You're an auditor. You're not a financial services provider registered with PICA and FaZe and the million other acts as the financial service providers have to comply with. So no. Any interest? So, you, number, so what is the issue? The issue is now merging money claiming money that isn't mine because that's not only illegal it's against the code as well now the biggest marks here come from the safeguards like i said there's like six okay so know this one it's quite a meaty one they like to ask the meaty ones because they want you to write a lot 
It's okay, you can plant some trees after this year is finished, okay. Safeguards, so, so what, the client gives you money, so what do you think I should do? What's the most logical thing to do? Okay, let me give you another example. We, we're walking we're walking to spa, me and you. We've both got our wallets in our hand, we're planning to buy a Coke. And you said to me, sure, I just need to go to the toilet quickly. Please hold my wallet for me. And I'll be like, okay, cool, I'm holding her wallet, I'm waiting for her. I'll just say, I'm gonna quickly, I'm just gonna walk around so long, I'll meet you in spa. She's in the loo, I've got her wallet in my hand. And I see something I really like. And I see she's got quite a bit of cash in her wallet. So I just use her money. What happens if she said to me, please buy me a Coke, I'm just going to go to the loo. Can I use her money then? Well, yeah, because she told me to use her money for the Coke. Am I going to put her money in my wallet and mix it up and shuffle it about? Okay, step one, separate bank account. Step two, if I buy the Coke for her and I say, yeah, they had a special, but I got you two Cokes for the price of one, then she's like, well, where's the slip? The client's going to want to know, well, I gave you 50 bucks and you're only giving me back 10. Why? Well, that's how much it costs for the special plus this. Recon. I want to see a recon of the money I gave you, the interest, the charges, the pluses, the minuses. Okay, that's step two. So separate, recon. Only use it for what the client has permitted you to use that for. What they love to say is, oh, the auditor was owed fees from the client, so the auditor just took the money out because it was owed to them anyway. I bought you a coffee last week, so you owed me that 20 rand anyway, so I'm just going to take it now. Do you do that? Like if your friend goes, to you don't do that. No, it's not okay. Only if she gives me permission to buy her a Coke will I take her money. Otherwise, I'm not going to dig in there. It's not mine. Yeah? Separate bank account. Recon, um, only use it for what the client permits you to use it for. Um, keeping it safeguarded, so you can't just put it like all the cash that he gave you like under your bed. Put it in an appropriate account where it's safeguarded and protected, okay? Because if it gets stolen, who's, who's in trouble? It's a very gray area, isn't it? Keep it safe, but in an appropriate bank account with appropriate access controls, yeah? Okay. Um, keep it separate from other client money. So if you've got three clients that have the issue, keep separate accounts for each of them. Don't use that money to lend money to that client, to lend money to that client. Whoa. No. It's separate. It's not yours. Other people's wallets that you're holding. It's not your money. Okay. Happy. Popular one. Financial interest. That one's quite obvious. Owning a shares in the client. Or it could be... Um, the one I saw, which one, what was the example? It was, I think it was in 20, last year's exam. I think it was something like he was auditing some sort of entity that managed student loans and you had a loan with that company that had, that you had a loan with the entity that you were managing the controls for or something and your loan was one of the outstanding amounts and you really struggling, obviously. You, you get what I'm saying, that loan might not be there anymore later, yeah? Anyway, obviously self-interest, it's a financial interest. Best answer, number one, dispose of the shares. If not possible, dispose of as many as possible so that it is no longer significant. Remember what I said, not only significant to the company, but to the human being involved in their personal you know, net wealth or whatever. Number three, get someone else, unfortunately, especially if it's a public interest client. You'll find that any entity that is listed um, both in South Africa and in America, you're not allowed to have even one cent of an interest in them. No matter how billionaire you are, not even one cent of it, because they're that strict with independence. And you'll see just now, we're going to talk about loans. So even if you're auditing a bank, you're not even allowed to have an account with that bank. Even if you're one of billions of people, then there's like three, but you're not allowed to have an account with the bank that you're auditing. They are that strict with it. It's very hectic. Okay, let me, let me um, clear that up. They say, okay, let me explain to you why I said you can't have an account with them. They say you can have an account, but at any point in time in that, in that history of that bank account, it is never allowed to exceed... $100 or go below $100, so it has to stay within that range. What is the purpose of an account, people? It's never, it's always, always going to move out of that range, which means you can't have an account. That's what, 
basically that's what I'm trying to tell you. So sometimes it gets very strict, okay. Okay, um, loans or guarantees? Normally, are you allowed a loan from a client? Sure, if that's their job. So if it's if you're auditing FNB or NetBank, sure. But NetBank is part of the old mutual group and they list in America, so no. So careful. Let's talk FNB then, because NetBank is special with its American rules. Okay. FNB, for example, are you allowed to have a loan with FNB and audit them? Yeah, you're one of uh, many that has a loan with them. As long as you don't have special interest rates or special conditions or special benefits that not every other person has the chance to have. As long as it's normal loan, as, as, as I would treat you the same as I would any other person in this room, then it's fine. Okay. Anything special, even like, remember what I said, even the slightest, tiniest bit of special, no. Okay. If the client is not a person that gives loans like a bank, then no. Okay. Cool. Business relationships. If you're auditing one of your customers or suppliers, can you do it? Sure. If you rely on them too much for your business, then maybe not. Why? Because you want to keep them happy, so you keep getting your supplies or your customers or whatever. Okay. So be careful of that. And then family and personal relationships is a tough one, right? Because it's not like shares that you can just dispose of, right? You can't be like, well, divorce your wife because... I have to audit this client. So unfortunately, the only way around this, there's no direct solution to it. The only way around it is if, depending on the level of the person involved, try to structure your work around it so you don't deal with that person. Alternatively, go off the team because you can't. Okay. So if the person is like the financial director and affects the whole app, then you can't do anything. But if that person's only responsible for like debts, then you can do like inventory or something different, you know what I'm saying? So not be involved with them at all. Get someone independent to review all your work and whatnot. Can you be offered a job at a client? Sure, it happens all the time. If that is the case, you have to disclose it to all parties involved and possibly be removed from the audit. Why? Because you don't want to upset your future boss, do you? That would be a career limiting move, wouldn't it? So yeah, you have to disclose it and you might need to be removed because you don't want to you're not going to be objective then. Working with the audit client, temporary assignments, typical self-review advocacy. Often clients, like someone goes on maternity leave, I don't know, and they say, auditor, please can you get me someone in finance just to help out for those three or four months? Self-review third people, you're in the finance department, you're going to do stuff that affects the apps. Self-review plus advocacy, remember. So is it allowed? Sure, it depends on what the position is and possibly that person can then not be maybe involved in the audit as well. Okay. Yeah, boy. It depends what position it is. For example, you'll see there I wrote directorship is prohibited, company secretary is prohibited, um, someone responsible for the preparation of the apps is prohibited. So it's it's really quite restrictive. So it's. Then they say that you're allowed to, if, if you assist, but you don't make any decisions, you simply execute, that's possibly allowed. So it, it gets, like I said, it gets very gray in practice. So you can argue, you know, but I didn't make any decisions. I just simply, you know, I simply execute. I didn't make decisions. They did all the, I just did what they told me. So in practice, like I said, it's, uh, but in theory, no. Yeah. Remember, we're focusing here on theory. No, not even slightly a little bit, maybe no. Okay. Good. Um, we spoke about that. Long association. Obviously, topically important, right? Familiarity threat. Two rules. Number one, individual human being rotation per Companies Act. Five years, two year cooling off. Number two, audit firm rotation. Ten years with a five year cooling off. So in your term of 10 years, you'll have two persons signing off those accounts in, at least. 
right? Because they can't be longer than five years each. Well, I suppose you could do five and then two break and then, yeah, boy. For public interest entities. Now, okay. The Code of Professional Conduct defines a public interest entity. Big wall between what the Companies Act calls public interest score. Now, it's very misleading. They are not the same thing. Okay. Public interest score and a public interest entity are not the same thing. This is in the Code of Professional Conduct. This is in the Companies Act. People often get confused. Go to the code and you'll see that they, they start off the first thing they write there, it's listed client. Okay. There's like 10 criteria. What makes it a public interest entity? Got nothing to do with the score. Okay. It's so confusing, actually, because if you read there, it says um, an entity that is required to be audited or something in the code. But if you go to the interpretations, and I've consulted with Psych on this and everything, they actually say, even though it says it may be an entity that needs to be audited, so if they say have a score of more than 350 or whatever, it doesn't automatically make them a public interest entity. So for public interest entities, Mandatory audit for a rotation. Recommended for all, obviously, from April 2023. So then they have to start rotating. So they can start early and make sure that by then they've really, you know, started the process, but they need to make sure that they have plans in place so that by then it's official. So let's say it's April 2023 and you're doing your 10th year. You have to then rotate because you've done 10, even though it was before the, you know, um, starting date, you've got to consider prior. So you've got to make plans in advance. You've got time to plan. So they're not saying right now, they're saying you've got time to sort yourselves out. Yeah. So there's no other safeguard here. This is the law. You don't have a choice. You please don't write any other safeguard. It is not relevant. So when there is a safeguard imposed by the law, you follow the law. Okay. Cool. Threats, this is threats like physical, like I'm going to fire you or else, or I'm going to you know, slash your tires or else, okay? We spoke about that. And then confidentiality, again, it's going to be quite an obvious one, okay? Especially, just be careful, confidentiality is often linked with insider trading, okay? And you know that's illegal, hey? Okay, so link that with professional behavior as well. And then chartered accountants in business. Remember what I said? Can you see how many situations we had for auditors and then we had some now for CAs? Can you see how it's much less? But sometimes what they do to be a little bit hectic, they ask you to discuss the code, but the auditor's done nothing wrong. And you're like, well, what the hell am I supposed to discuss? Well, then you discuss the CA in business. Are they providing false information? Are they bribing someone? Are they you know, not complying with the accounting laws or, you know, I don't know, human slavery laws, whatever. Okay. So that's what makes it tricky. If they don't ask if the audit is perfect, but then someone at the company then you need to remember that that's also an option to discuss the CA in business. Okay. And we've spoken about the technique. Questions? Sweet. So we've got King next. Let's take 10 and we'll do King. <laughs> 